right. Good morning, church. How we doing? We doing all right? About half of you are doing all right. Come on, you can do better than that. How are you this morning? We're doing okay. All right. Hey, just go ahead and turn to your neighbor. Tell them to wake up. Let's go. Tell them, wake up. Come on, we're about to bring a word, and the word of God is alive and active. Can I get an amen, somebody, right? And we are in this series called the Beatitudes, and this series is really not for the faint of heart. You know, like I try to be like a, somewhat of like an inspirational like pastor, right? Like I want to bring you a word. I know you get hell all week, so I want to like give you a piece of heaven. But it's like this Beatitude series, like I'm trying my best to like make it inspirational, but it's so countercultural. I feel like I'm just putting you through like spiritual CrossFit every week, right? Like it's just like the, the top of like Mount Everest, like hiking up, like it's very... Uh, like it hurts so good, like that's kind of how I feel about this series and these messages, like every time Jesus lays one of these things down, it's like, man, it's like, it's what's best for us, but you know, it's, it's a workout spiritually to actually live this way and to live this out, and so I really want you to wake up this morning, I want you to lean in, uh, let's one time welcome those in that are watching online, our family from online. <laughs> Especially our Massachusetts family that watches all the way from Massachusetts. It's super cool. I actually get to go visit them in August. So I'm looking forward to going up there and visiting with that group of people and just seeing what God is doing uh, up there and with them. Uh, so I'm excited about continuing in this series. This is the seventh Beatitude. So we're going to take another break. So we've kind of put this series in between like Easter and next week is Mother's Day. So we're going to take another mini break. And y'all, just let me tell you, Mother's Day is going to be phenomenal, okay? Like, I don't want to be like one of these preachers like every week, like, oh, it's going to be amazing, it's going to be phenomenal, like, you know, but next week, it's going to be legit, and so you got to get here. Mothers, you got to do everything you can to get your children here, get your parents here, get, your, get everybody here. Uh, Mother's Day is actually the second largest attended Sunday of the year, so you want to make sure you get here early. It's going to be packed, it's going to be awesome as well. And then the final week, I'll be back to conclude our Beatitude series, and we will have walked through all eight of them. Uh, and I hope that those of you who have been on this journey with us uh, feel like you have felt some spiritual growth. You've built some spiritual muscle. Um, and you're going to need that going into the next series, because it's going to be kind of like the Beatitudes Part 2 as we jump into parables uh, from Jesus. And everything that Jesus speaks, whether it's parables, whether it's these Beatitudes, it just runs so countercultural to what the world is throwing you uh, today. And it's like, I heard one time they said that the Beatitudes is like a nail in the coffin uh, of self. Like every Beatitude is another nail in the coffin of self. And it's just, we're trying to, and my kids asked me yesterday, we were talking about our baseball team, and one of the, they asked us, what does it mean to be selfish? You, you talk about, what does it mean to be selfish? And I got to explain to them from a, from a sports standpoint what it looks like to be a team player and to be about the team and, and to not be selfish. And as I look at these Beatitudes, it really is a spiritual workout uh, and, and a gravitational pull away from, uh, from oneself. So let's jump into the seventh Beatitude today. <clears throat> this is Matthew 5, uh, verse 9. <clears throat> it says this right here. Blessed are the peacemakers... For they will be called children of God. Now, every single word of this is kind of rich, so I want to look at it throughout this sermon. Uh, the first word, obviously, is blessed. We've talked about this, and this is not a superficial blessing. This is not when things are going good. I'm happy, and I've got favor. When I bought a new car, I got blessed. When I got a new house, this is, we're talking about an internal joy that we have inside of us that's bigger than any circumstances we face. And if you haven't uh, you know, watch some of these sermons uh, from the past. If you haven't been here, you can watch them online or on our app. But we went through, and, and every time he starts off with this word blessed, and he says blessed are the poor in spirit. We talked about that in week one. That's talking about people who are dependent upon God. Blessed are people who mourn, who are meek, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who are merciful. And last week, Pastor Chris brought us a message about being pure in heart. And if we are all those things, and we actually are obedient to those and live those out, God will bless us, not with something that's circumstantial, not something that was just favor for a season, but it's an internal joy that nothing can shake, and it's like the world can be in chaos, confusion, all around you can be shaken, but you are not shaken, you are grounded in the Lord, and you have a peace 
and you have shalom, and you have like this, this understanding that God is God and he's on his throne, and you're just not shaking. And it is a powerful thing to be blessed in that way. But it only comes by living the way that Jesus asked us to live. Now, you need to understand that the Beatitudes are also like a ladder, like they kind of stack on top of each other. And Jesus is preaching this Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7, chapters 5 through 7. And he, and, he, and he lists out these Beatitudes, and he's going down, and the crowd that he's speaking to is gasping at every single one. Because you've got to understand, these people were being taught, you know, in the Old Testament, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? Like somebody hits you, you hit them back. You give them what they gave you. And then he just kind of comes with this countercultural message of just like boom, boom, boom. And every one of those ones that I just listed, they would have been gasping. But today we're on the seventh one, and, and the seventh one is... An important one, like in Jewish culture, the, the number seven means perfection or completeness. So they were always looking for what is he going to put at number seven. And so they've been gasping at the first six, but on the seventh one, it brings a jaw drop. You can almost like see it. And so Jesus knew this, and he said this, blessed are the peacemakers. Again, in Jewish life, it's like, it's like the highest ideal of life was to bring Peace. Now, how many of you would say in 2022, maybe in the last, let's just say week, maybe month, you need, be honest, a little bit more peace? Anybody? You could use a little bit more peace. Like, if you had a little bit more peace, like, it'd be, okay, right? Like, thank you very much, because I'm definitely in that season right now where I just would love some more peace. Because I read a stat the other day that said crazy went up by 400% last year, right? And it's just like, everywhere you look, cray cray's happening out there, right? All around. And your boy, your pastor, needs some peace. Now, the reality is, is peace is not the absence of conflict. Like, we think if there's just no, no more war, right, then there would be peace. But there's a lot of countries out there who are not at war, but they're not at peace. We feel like if they're, my wife and I and my spouse, like, we're, we're, there's the absence of argument. We haven't argued in a while, then there would be peace. But that's not necessarily so. We think if we have the absence of stress and anxiety, that then, then I must, if I, if I don't have stress or anxiety, then I must have peace. Like if I didn't have that boss, if I didn't really have that job, if I could just have a spa day every day, right? Like if I could just go golfing, if I could go fishing, if I could just do all the stuff that I wanted to do, then I would just have peace. But you need to understand that just a vacation type life does not bring peace. Real lasting peace. Jeremiah 6, 14 says, peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. And so peace is something that we can never achieve on our own. It's, not, it's never found in the absence of, it's actually the opposite, it's found in the presence of. The word peace comes from the Hebrew word shalom. Everybody say shalom. If you ever go to Israel with me, that's how our guide greets us every morning. He says, shalom, shalom, everybody. And he's talking about peace. That's the greeting that he gives us. And here's what that means. It's a wholeness, a completeness, fulfillment, inner rest, living without deficiency or lack. So this is what God wants for us and has for us. And The best news ever is nothing it has nothing to do with external circumstances. You can have peace in the midst of crazy situations. And again, this is what God wants for us. But to have it, man, we have to have it first before we ever think about giving it. Because God does want us to forgive it. That's the second part of the word, is maker. He doesn't just want peace for us. He wants us to be a peacemaker. So we have to have peace first. Then we have to learn to make it, and we have to learn to give it. <clears throat> the word maker actually means to do. And so what we are commissioned to do as followers of Jesus is to go out and to sow peace, to do peace wherever we go in life. Now you need to understand that peacemaking is a lot different than peacekeeping, right? Like we think if we just, uh, you know, a lot of us were, like that's what I'm in, like as a dad, as a father right now with my three kids, Shapiro's birthday is today, he turned eight. I've got a six-year-old and a four-year-old, and at my house right now, I'm just trying to keep the peace, right? Like, Lauren often comes to me, she was like, I'm at my wits end, I don't know what to do. I'm like, just separate them, right? 
Put him in his room in the corner. Put him there. Do something with Merrick, even though she's not the problem. And then we might have some peace. Anybody with me feel that today, right? Some of the grandparents are in here like, oh, I've been through that season. I've been through that season, right? I remember what that's like. Well, it's crazy right now in my house, people. And it is like, just to get the peace, I feel like, you know, we just got to separate everybody. Um, it, there was one time, and it's not too long ago, where, uh, you know, Shapiro and, and Miller are just in the stage where they just love each other to death, right? <laughs> like, you know what I'm talking about, where they just fight, and they fight, and they fight, and they're like wrestling. And one time I was up, you know, and they were, they were wrestling on the bed. It was like, and I can hear everything downstairs, so I go upstairs, and they're fighting, they're rolling, and they pull each other off the bed, and then they start like, you know, I'm like trying to separate them, and then they start like blaming each other, and it's like, you hurt me, and the other one's like, no, no, you hurt me, and then they're like, let's do it again, right, and you're like, what, <laughs> I'm losing my mind, people, okay, like, uh, what is going on here, but, but isn't that like the world, though, right, like, that's how the world reacts, we act like kids, so it's like, you hurt me, no, you hurt me. And we're just in this cycle of craziness where we think if, you know, we, and we just need to have the absence of that. And somehow we'll have peace. And that's just not true. Because biblical peacemaking is just the opposite. It actually, a lot of times it comes with conflict. And we, we because it, it confronts. So anywhere there is a lack in society or with someone that we know that's in our sphere, God is calling us to step up in our wholeness and our completeness in Jesus Christ, and we step into that situation with truth. Do you understand? So it's not with judgment. It's not with the finger pointing. It's stepping in with truth, and then you become a peacemaker. And when you become a peacemaker, it says they will call you children of God. And so God is a God of peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and we are called to be peacemakers living out our identity and our heritage in Jesus. And so when the Bible talks about peacemaking, this is what it's talking about. Here's what peacemaking is for my note takers out there. It's when we take our wholeness and completeness, the shalom of God, the peace of God that we have, that we found when we placed our faith in him, and we take that into a world that desperately needs us. This is what we are called and commissioned to do, but the problem is, if if we Christians and, and I'm hey I'm in this boat, I'm talking to me today. We got to have it first. We got to harness the peace of God first before we can ever take it into the world. And so the question for us today is, how do we do this? I mean, this is the big idea. More than ever, we need to dig into this mature word. We t- we need to learn how to be peacemakers, not just peacekeepers, but peace. Maker. So here's the first thing that needs to happen. I'm going to give you two points today, and I'm going to give you three letter points under each of those points. So my type A people, like, this is your Sunday, okay? My note takers, like, you're like, this is what I came to church for, all right? So I got two points, and then I've got three points under each, all right? Here's the first thing that needs to happen if you want to be a peacemaker. Number one, we have to experience peace in our hearts. First thing. To be a peacemaker. Again, we cannot give what we do not have. And we often look for peace in the wrong places. If we could just get away, if we could just escape, if I could just go on that cruise, if I could just get a vacation, if I could just get away from him, if I could just get away from her, if I could just get off of social media, right? And so we just think that that is what's going to bring peace. But the right place that really brings peace is God's word. Can I get an amen, right? When we do that, and so I want to give you three points as to how we experience peace in our hearts, and we can harness it, and we can get it first before we can give it. Letter A point here is this, experience the peace with our God. So we have to understand that God is the source of all things peace, and without tapping into his peace, we never can have it anyway. Romans 5, 1 and 2 says this, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight, by faith. So go back to that moment where you placed your faith in Jesus. That's when you gained peace. 
It says when we when we uh, were made right with God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserving privilege. So we're not so even we don't not even deserving where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, just let that fall fresh on you today that we find peace in God. And we found, we first found peace when we placed our faith in Jesus. And so sometimes you get crazy and you get caught up, right? And that saying you know you're in a season of chaos. You have to return back to and remember the time you place your faith in Jesus. Where you were, how far God has brought you, and a lot of times that will help you harness the peace. Now, if you're not, you're not a follower of Jesus, you never placed your faith in Jesus. Like, you never had a moment where you, you could call it your spiritual birthday. Where, where the Bible says that you got to be born again. So you're born once by, 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 by your mom, right? An earthly birth. But then you have to be born again spiritually. And if you've never been born again spiritually, it's just where you make a decision to follow Jesus, and, and, and that becomes your spiritual birthday, and when that happens for you in that moment, people, I'm telling you, in that moment, you get the peace of God. And, it, and it's phenomenal. And it's the peace that passes all understandings. You can't explain it to your friends. You can't explain it to your sphere. It's, it's beyond, it blows your mind, that type of peace. But it only comes from God when you place your faith in him. And if you've never done that, you can do that today. You don't need me to like lead you in a prayer. You don't like literally you can make a decision to follow Jesus today. If you want somebody to pray with you, you can stop at next steps. Like any week here, any any time, you can call the church. If if you ever want to place your faith in Jesus and experience that peace, you can do that. You don't have to wait for a preacher to lead you to that. But once you have peace with God and from God, let her be. Now we need to experience peace within ourselves. Experience peace within ourselves. And it's so helpful for you to discover who God made you to be, for you to understand how God made you in his image, who you are in him. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so how do we have peace with ourselves? First, got to have peace with God, then we got to have peace with ourselves, and that happens when we come to prayer before God. And then we come with petition and thanksgiving, right? So how do we regain peace? By prayer, petition, and thanksgiving to God. What is prayer? Prayer is just coming before God and being honest with Him. God, I'm in a mess. I'm in a season right now with my kids where I don't know what to do, and I need your wisdom, and I'm asking you to give me uh, the wisdom that is of you. That's what petition is. So now petition is, God, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I would want you to do about it. Here's how I need your help. And then Thanksgiving is, before I ever get an answer, before you ever show up on the scene, I'm going to give you praise, and I'm going to thank you in advance. No matter what the outcome and the circumstance and the situation, I give you praise. And by prayer, petition, and thanksgiving, we, we gain the peace of God, and we have peace within ourselves. Again, we're talking about how do we bring peace to our hearts? Peace with God, peace with ourselves, and then let her see peace with our circumstances. And I believe you have to have the first two to have this third one. John 16, says this about peace with our circumstances. It says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So you need to just go ahead and expect that your circumstances are going to present a situation That will create opportunities for you to lose peace. And trouble will be at every corner. That's what this life is. Everywhere you turn, there's going to be trouble. And and like the big, big trouble normally like pushes you towards God, honestly. I mean, I've seen it. Like someone passes away or you get health news that's devastating. Oftentimes that pushes an individual toward God. 
You know what pushes us really away from God? Is this the little trouble that just peck, 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 pecks at you day in, day out, and you don't even realize it until after several months you wake up and you go, how did I get here? And it was almost like death by a thousand paper cuts. It was just little, 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 right? I mean, this is how, like, I get to a place in my house where I just, like, lose my mind. I mean, I just feel like when I was writing this series, I was like, these people are going to think this is, like, therapy with my family and my kids right now. But that's all I got. I mean, I'm just trying to be vulnerable with, like, where I'm at. Like, somebody tell me why I got to tell my kids four and five and six times to do the same thing. And then you multiply that by three. So I'm telling them to do something. I got to tell each kid three and four times. You add that up. I'm not good at math, but it's like... A dozen? And you think, like when you, you know, you guys know this, but I just let me vent for a minute. You know, like when you have kids and you got like a little baby, you're like, oh my gosh, it's like my job to keep this little thing alive. And there's like pressure there, right? And the, ride, the first ride home, I remember the first ride home, bringing Shapiro home. Like, I mean, I was going like 35 and a 65, like, right? Like both hands on the steering wheel. Like I was just like nervous and like everything is like physical, like, you know, we got to, like, feed the baby. We're up all night. We get no sleep. Like, it's just like, you know, everything is, like, physically draining. And then you get toddlers that can talk and have a mind of their own. And then it becomes draining mentally. Anybody with me? You know what I'm saying? And it's like, I'm telling you three times. I'm telling you four times. What is wrong with you? I told you not Crocs today. I told you I want your tennis shoes on. Like, and it's just like, Okay, all right, back in the Holy Spirit here, I'm going to, thanks for being my, but, it, but listen to me, what I, my point is, is, is that day after day after day after day, after day after day after day, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> someday I'm losing my mind. I'm saying things that a pastor should never say, <laughs> right? And I, and I wake up and I go, I've lost my peace, not because anything big or devastating has happened, but because I just haven't paid attention to it, and just day after day, it's just like, ugh, ugh. and I have to guard against that. I have to be better that, for that moving forward, um, and how I'm protecting my peace, and how I'm not forfeiting it up with the circumstances that are surrounding me. Listen, everything isn't going to work out in this life. It's not going to be perfect. I think we all have kids, you know, those of us that have kids, you grow up and you think they're just going to be perfect and they're just never going to make any mistakes. I mean, you know that they're not, but then there's this reality that when they do make a mistake, it's like, what? And that's why you have to live with the end in mind. Like, Jesus got up from the grave. We know the end of the story. There is victory. And so we're living not for victory, but from victory. And you just got to live and going, hey, in this world, I'm going to have trouble. But thank God that Jesus has overcome it all. So that's how we kind of bring peace to our hearts. Is, you know, we got to have peace with God. We got to have peace with ourselves. And then we got to make peace with our circumstances, knowing that trouble is going to come. And if we, we do those things, peace will be in our hearts. Now, the second part of being a peacemaker is this right here, point number two, is that we got to extend peace through our lives. You got to extend. So now, I, I, when I get peace in my heart, now it's my job and my commission and my command from God to give it and to live it. Peace in the Bible is described as a not as a lake, but in Isaiah sixty six, it's described as a river, something that flows through us. So peace doesn't just come to us; it's to flow through us and to the world. You know, this past September eleventh was the twentieth year anniversary and I, I don't know you know I, I usually watch you know the ceremony each year but this one just carried a little bit more weight and as you think about September 11th one of the things that I think about is really the firefighters I mean I think about how all the people within the building are trying to get out of the building and rightfully so the, the building is on fire and they're trying their best to, to get out but then I think about the firefighters and they're running in and you think about what is it that was within them that made them run into the fire like it certainly wasn't a paycheck right it's not you know you know this is my job 
Like there was a purpose and there was a calling on their life. And they were called and commissioned really by the Lord to run into the fire and to save as many people as they could. And When I think about that, I think about how our world is on fire. And I think about how we as Christians, honestly, a lot of times we, we want to run out. We, we just want out. We want to get to our corner. We just want to be absent of conflict. We don't want to, no, nope, I'm not going to run, you know, I'm not going to mess that up. I'm just going to kind of stay neutral, you know. Listen, the world is on fire right now, and we are called in commission to be peacemakers. We should be running into the fire with the truth of God's grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not judging, not uppity thinking we're better than anybody else, but with humility and mercy and sowing seeds of peace in places and people where there is lack and where there is no peace. And oftentimes we Christians, we just want out. I'm just going to take care of mine, my family, as long as I'm good. No, nah, we, we are called to run into a world right now that is on fire. So how do we do that? Letter A, we're going to extend peace through our lives through staying focused on the real issue. So, so the enemy of peace is not your job, is not your boss, it's not losing a basketball game, it's not social media, it's not politics, it's not a pandemic, it's not a you know, supply chain issue. And one thing you need to know about peacemakers is they don't cast blame or make excuses. They just have the right perspective. That John 10.10, 10, this is the perspective they have, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But that Jesus came, that they may have life and have it abundantly. And so when things are chaos, they're not blaming anybody else. They go, you know what, we have an enemy. The enemy of peace is the, is the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus has come, and he's brought the peace. We have to harness the peace. We have to give the peace. We have to live the peace. So we got to understand, if we want to be peacemakers, we got to understand the real issue. we got to see the right perspective. Letter B, we need to see others through God's eyes. So peacemakers are never judgmental. They, they never use words that are divisive. They never go on rants on Facebook. They see others the way that God sees them. And right now, everybody, the news, everybody is only seeing our differences and pointing out our differences. And it's like, hey, look at their differences. Look at that. Look how we're different. Look at how we're different. Now let's all get along. <laughs> and it doesn't work that way. We have to understand that we're the same in a lot of ways. We can't let people point out our differences so much that that divides us and separates us into our own corners. It's really not as much about our differences. It's about what makes us the same. And to prove it, God puts this in the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1.27. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So the most common ground we can find in humanity Every person on the planet, <clears throat> every nationality, every race, every person that is breathing on this earth starts in the same place that we were all made in the image of God. Therefore, they are worthy of dignity and respect because God's image is in everybody. <clears throat> no matter if you disagree with them or not, no matter if you're different than them or not. And we as peacemakers have to start there. And we will have the opportunity to, to sow peace where it doesn't exist. And peacemaking is not passive. I just want to belabor that point. And, and, and it's not passive because oftentimes it brings conflict because truth is conflict. So I'm not backing down from truth. We're living out of it. And we're bringing truth into situations and circumstances. So they are made in the image of God. And if they lack peace, they are worthy enough for us to step into that space and place and share what God has done for us, no matter how different they might be. And this is how we step into a world and actually make a difference. It's very hard, but it's possible. 
and powerful when done in that way. And if we do it by the power of the Holy Spirit, we really can change our community and change our state and change our world. This is the hour for the church to step up. I'll be honest with you, I'm tired of the big C church just talking about how everything's going to hell, the next generation's going to hell, like this is this, and this, I, just, I just can't wait till Jesus comes back. We're just going to throw my hands up, uh, come Lord Jesus, come on now, because I'm done, right? It's like, no, like, come on. This is when we got to step up and bring peace, all right? This is when we got to harness the completeness and the wholeness that God has given to us, and let's sow peace into the world. Listen, God's asking you to step up. Not to bow down and be discouraged because of what you see in the world. It's actually going to, it'll be our finest hour if we do that. Let us see if we want to extend peace. We've got to spread peace by living peace. Spread peace by living peace. Now that I got it, I got to live it. And I can't live it if I don't first have it. Martin Luther King said this, be the peace you wish to see in the world. So a lot of people will spend a lot of time complaining about the peace that they don't see, how everybody's like divided and we'll spend so much talking about it when what we need to do is be about it. I mean, we're the solution of what we're complaining about. James 3.18 says this, and those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. So it's the peacemakers that will plant seeds. So you think, well, I'm a peacemaker, like I, I can't bring peace to the world. Listen, you can't do it all. I can't do it all. But you know what I can do day in and day out in my sphere, to the, my family, to the people at my workplace, the people in my classroom, is I can just sow seeds of peace. Like tomorrow at work when something comes up and, and there's really no reason for you to be kind, but you be, you be kind anyways. You just sow in seeds of peace. In your family where there's dissension, you're going to be slow to speak, quick to listen. This one's for me right here. You're going to be quick to apologize. Sowing seeds of peace. Holding doors for people who go into the restaurant, not always trying to be the first. Sowing seeds of It doesn't have to be some grand thing that I got to change the world. No, just day in and day out, so in peace. Wherever there is that you encounter incompleteness and brokenness, step into that and have conversation. Number three. So I lied to you. I told you I had two points and three. I lied to you. I guess you got three points. We evidence peace to our world. Number three, we evidence peace to our world. So Matthew says that they will be called children of God. So if you're a peacemaker, they will be called children of God. You say, well, when, I thought I was a children, child of God when I placed my faith in Jesus. I mean, that's what you talk about, Pastor Matt. You know, you call us all children. You're a child of God. And yes, that is true. <clears throat> what Matthew is saying is that when you're a peacemaker, the world that doesn't even believe in God, they will call you children of God. That is powerful. Because an unbelieving world goes, I don't know what's different about this person, but man, it's just like nothing shakes them. They don't ever get angry. They don't, you know, they just sow seeds of peace. Like they're just they're so pleasant to be around. They're a person that I'm that I just love to see coming down the aisle. I love to encounter them. My day gets better when I'm around them, and I don't really believe in this God or whatever, but I can tell you what, the only explanation I got is they must be a child of God. That, my friends, is powerful. Blessed are the peacemakers, for the world will take notice, and they will call you. They'll have no other explanation. They will call you children of God. The greatest evidence that we have that God is who he says he is. It's not standing on a street with a bullhorn. It's not getting your sandwich board. It's not sharing 
your political opinion, your religious opinion on social media, trying to make a point, and you're trying so much that you make a point that you really don't make a difference. The greatest evidence is when we band together as one, and we're peacemakers in a world that is on fire and knows no peace, especially the peace that we have in Jesus. There's a song that came out two weeks ago, and I've just had it on repeat in my car, and it's a country song. I know not everybody's like country fans, but it's a song by Morgan Wallen. It actually went to number one in two weeks. It's only the third song to ever do that, and the song is called Don't Think Don't Think Jesus. Has anybody heard this song? Anybody? I just want to read the lyrics to you, and it's kind of like a parable And it's actually the people who wrote the song wrote it for him because they knew what he was going through. See, he grew up in the church, went his own way like the prodigal son, and he's made several mistakes in the last two years. It's almost cost him his career and cost him, and God is getting a hold of his heart. And so they wrote this song for him. He heard it, and he recorded it. It's went to number one uh, in two weeks. It's number one right now. And it's a very powerful song about Jesus. So I really want you to lean into this. I'm going to try to share it. I know reading lyrics sometimes is boring. But I want you to lean into this because I want to make a point at the end. Here's how the song starts. I got the lyrics on the screen for you. It says, boy gets a guitar and starts writing songs about whiskey and women and getting two stone. Okay, country song right there. Okay, people write like, okay. We got to throw that in. If you've got little kids, just cover their ears or something. Um, And then it says, he got all three at the first show he played. His hometown, so he's talking about my hometown, my friends, my family. Hometown said, I don't think Jesus done it that way. Boy moves to city, so now he's moving away from the hometown. Lives fast and goes hard. Starts chasing the devil through honky-tonk bars. Ignoring the voices in his head that say, I don't think Jesus done it this way. So he's talking about how, man, like, I'm, I'm living in sin and I... The Holy Spirit and God is telling me that Jesus didn't do it this way, but I'm ignoring that. And Then he goes into a, a place where he talks about if, if he was Jesus. And he's basically saying, if I, if I was Jesus, I would say, to hell with you. Ain't no helping you. Find someone else to give heaven to. I'm telling you, I'd shame me. I'd blame me. I'd make me pay for my mistakes. But I don't think Jesus does it that way. Anybody grateful Jesus doesn't do it that way? It says, boy's all alone, got no one to turn to. He figures he'll pray because what else could he do? He said, I wish you would have woke me up an easier way. So now he's talking to Jesus and saying, man, Jesus, I wish you would have woken me up a different way. And then it says, but I don't think Jesus does it that way. And he says it again. If I was Jesus, I'd say to hell with you. Ain't no helping you. Find someone else to give heaven to. I'm telling you, I'd shame me. I'd blame me. I'd make me pay for my mistakes. I don't think Jesus does it that way. And this is where I really want to hone in. This is for us today. It says, the world likes to rear back and throw a few stones. So boy, he's talking about himself. So boy wants to throw a few stones of his own. Then he becomes first person and he says, but Lord knows I ain't perfect and it ain't my place. And I don't think Jesus done it that way. And he poses the question to you, to everybody listening. Are y'all sure that Jesus done it that way? Here's what I want, here's the picture I want to paint is right now in the cancel culture of our world when somebody makes a mistake, Everybody's throwing stones from the left to the right. I mean, we are living in a society and a world where everybody is throwing stones, even Christians. And we think since stones are being thrown at us, stones are being, I've got a few stones I would like to throw. But that's not the way of Jesus. And what I want to tell you in a world right now of stones being hurled all over the place. We are called in commission to run into that and sow seeds of peace and forgiveness and mercy and 
grace and we are to be different because blessed are the peacemakers for they will realize we are different and we are children of God. And we don't throw the stones. Come on, you can clap for that. And I just want to call, I just want to commission you if you've never heard it before to go outside of these four walls and to be a peacemaker. You got to have the peace first. You got to have the peace first, and you can give it. Sowing it and giving it is hard. It's not easy. Man, it's fulfilling, and it's satisfying, and it's why Jesus died for you and for me, that we would have life to the fullest and a life of satisfaction. Can I pray for you? I just want to pray that you would be full of peace and that you would really take this to heart. Don't, like, don't be like, the Christian that's like, oh, man, that was a good word, pastor, and it just kind of goes in one ear, out the other. Like, no, like embody this. It doesn't matter if you came to church today. If you leave today and you don't implement this, it's like buying a treadmill and looking at it and thinking you, got, you did something. You, didn't, you know what I'm saying? It's application that makes the difference. Let's do something about it. Let's sow seeds of peace this week, this month, this year for the rest of our lives. Let me pray for you and commission you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for what you're doing in our church. God, right now, I just fall, or I just ask you for the peace that passes all understanding to fall on us fresh and anew. For the Christian that's in the room, I pray that they would just remember how you saved them. Uh, The moment they placed their faith in you, God, I just pray that you would restore their peace, that they would uh, harness that in their hearts with you themselves and with their circumstances. Father, I pray right now for the person who doesn't know your peace. They think they do just because they're absent of maybe conflict, but they've never had a spiritual birthday and they've never placed their faith in you. God, I pray right now they would make a decision to follow you. They would say, Jesus, I place my faith in you. I believe in you. I believe you died for me. You are my Lord. If that's you right now, just tell him. Just go ahead and tell him. I place my faith in you. I believe that you are my Lord. You are my Savior, and I want your peace, God. And I pray for all of us today that we would have an urgency, that we would harness that calling, and we know that we would be commissioned, we would take it seriously, like in every conflict, in every conversation where there is a lack, where there is no peace, I pray that we would sow peace there that we would begin to change our community, our state, our world. But it would start small and we would take responsibility and that all of us would be peacemakers infiltrating a world that's on fire, a world that is casting stones. We wouldn't just try to separate people, but we would speak truth and grace and mercy to all circumstances, situations, and into all conversations and people. We love you, Jesus, and we're thankful for this word that is hard to hear, that is a mature word, We don't just thank you for the inspirational stuff. We thank you for the challenging stuff. Thank you for challenging us today. We love you, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Thank you, church. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. We pray that this ministry has been a blessing to you. And if it has, would you consider partnering with us financially? You can do that simply through giving through the Rescue House app or making a donation online at our website. And you too can be a part of helping others discover who God made them to be. And if today's message impacted you, would you share it with a friend or a family member? And lastly, if you're in the area, we would love to meet you in person. So join us next Sunday at our Moxville campus location. Now, go be who God made you to be.